It's my immense uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our keynote speaker of uh, this uh, Vienna Arbitration Days. Uh, professor Catherine Rogers um, is a professor at law at Penn State University and Queen Mary University of London. Uh, she teaches um, and researches professional ethics and the intersection of markets and regulations guiding professional conduct. She is what I would call the conscious of the arbitration community. She is also a reporter of the restatement of the US law of international arbitration and she sits on several boards. One we are very proud of is the International Advisory Board of the Vienna International Arbitral um, Center, VIAC, uh, which gives us an opportunity to meet and learn from her. Now, in addition to her academic positions, uh, Professor Rogers is also the founder of Arbitrator Intelligence. Um, and that's a truly exciting project uh, which in my view will fundamentally change um, the arbitration and the way we uh, operate in arbitration. A project that aims uh, to promote transparency, accountability and diversity in international arbitrator appointments. So um, I would call it, it's really the visualization and implementation of the conscious of the arbitration community, what she's working on. And her presentation today will be focusing on this project and promises to tell us how arbitrator intelligence will soon be introduced. And um, I think this is something uh, that will have us shaken and not just stirred. So Catherine, the floor is all yours. So, let me, wow, that's loud, excuse me. So let me start by thanking uh, the organizers. Uh, it's you know, now commonplace that almost every city on the planet has an arbitration day, or they're expanding into weeks now. Um, but it's hard to match the splendor that is Vienna and such a gorgeous day. I don't know if you specially ordered that, Nicholas, but thank you. So let me thank the organizers. When I was invited to give this speech, um, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity, given the topic uh, and uh, about psychology and technology, uh, to bring to you insights about what we've been working on at Arbitrator Intelligence. But I'm going to start somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to start with the idea that if James Bond practiced law, of course, we know it would be international arbitration. The world would not be enough. And how do we know this? Because there are so many international arbitrations that would make the, great, uh, uh, the plot of a great James Bond film, right? So it might be that diamonds are forever for James Bond, uh, but if you are the uh, a, a Swiss diamond company operating in the state of Lesotho, uh, maybe that's not the case. Now, Hugo Chavez thought he had a gold finger when he nationalized all the natural resources in Venezuela, but instead what he did was buy himself a lot of investment arbitration claims. There is also a, an example of investors in a Laotian casino royale uh, where things went wrong and government investigations of corruption uh, took over. And then, of course, we all know that from Russia with love, we got the Yukos case, uh, the largest case to date. Now, in one that I don't even think Ian Fleming could come up with, uh, we have an Israeli investor who found out the hard way that the spy who loved me uh, can be a dangerous double agent. This case involves a, uh, uh, and brought together a buccaneering tycoon investor uh, with a lavish Italian yacht, uh, an aging and now deceased Ghanaian dictator, uh, and his youngest and most beautiful of four wives, um, uh, the biggest iron ore resources on the planet in one of the poorest countries on the planet, 
uh, a wiretap, uh, the FBI, the philanthropist George Soros, a French businessman, armies of lawyers, several Swiss investigators, racketeering charges in New York, a McMansion in Florida, and apparently rigging of an uh, African election. So again, this is the a plot of a perfect James Bond film. Now, we all know, for those of you who are James Bond uh, aficionados, that James Bond has the best toys. He has the most wonderful technology, right? And it's always introduced in the film by Q. So he has, let's see, the couch, in case you want to get rid of an adversary. And who doesn't need a ski pole that's also a cannon? And just in case you get caught somewhere, a ring that will shatter glass. So though, that's the technology that James Bond is operating with in all these films. What's the technology that we use in international arbitration to select international arbitrators? The telephone. <laughs> we all know that when you're looking for an arbitrator, yes, you might send out a sort of modern email, and you ask everyone, you know, do, have you ever sat with this arbitrator? Do you know this arbitrator? Have you appeared before him or her recently? Why? Because, now this is not meant to scandalize everyone, it's a bit risque, okay? Because in international arbitration, the outcomes are always for your eyes only. Arbitration is confidential, and that makes it very difficult to have a publicly available resource to exchange information about arbitrators and their track records and histories. But that's all about to change. Uh, what we have done with Arbitrator Intelligence is we've come up with what I think is a hack. We are a legal technology platform, and the hack we came up with is a way to preserve confidentiality of the arbitration, but nevertheless uncover and make use of some very important data that comes out. So let me show you how it works. At the end of an arbitration, an award is rendered, okay, and we know that most of those are confidential, but what we have is an online confidential questionnaire that we call the AIQ, the Arbitrator Intelligence Questionnaire. It does not ask information about the identity of the parties. It does not ask information uh, about uh, the case that would reveal anything dis uh, that's uh, confidential. And even though we verify the people who fill it out, uh, the verification and the identity of the people who complete the AIQ is kept separate from the AIQ. So in all these ways, we preserve confidentiality, but out of that questionnaire, we get from the case a bunch of really important data, data that people need, people want to know when they're selecting arbitrators. Uh, and what we are in the process of doing now is turning that data into what we call AI reports, or arbitrator intelligence reports. And the idea is that when these are ready, within this year, 2019, you will be able to purchase the AI reports from Kluwer uh, and use them to select your new arbitrators. And when we think about selecting arbitrators, let's just pause here for a moment, because we, we all spend a lot of time selecting our own arbitrators. But I'd like to contrast this technology to what exists now in courts for judges. Now, we all know you don't get to choose your judge, but there are now judicial analytics available, particularly in the United States, and you can find out every ruling that a judge has made, what was the outcome, what's the percentage of rate, the rate at which they grant this particular motion or deny this particular motion. Uh, and, but you don't get to choose your uh, judge, you do get to choose your arbitrator. This is one of the most critically sensitive moments in the case, but until now we've relied on a uh, relatively low-tech uh, telephone. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to, and I want to say again, uh, when I was invited to do this, I thought, okay, well, this is a great time to launch. So this is the official launch. You are the first audience ever to see, uh, to preview our AI reports. I'm going to give you just a glimpse of what they uh, look like. So we chose as our prototype a fictitious arbitrator named Diana Artemis. We imagine her to be kind of a mid-level, since I'm here, Eastern European woman arbitrator who's really quite awesome, I have to say. And this is what our reports will look like. So again, this is a hypothetical arbitrator, and all this 
All this data is hypothetical as well. But you'll have a dashboard, and then the reports will be interactive so that you can, uh, essentially, there'll be a, like a tutorial on how to use them as you're working through the reports. And then they will have all sorts of useful data. Here, for example, if you want to know uh, what do we mean by a prevailing party, there'll be a definition that's part of a pop-up. We also have a, a important, uh, and this is much more detailed information later in the report, but here's an overview of the information that we have on various procedural rulings uh, and outcomes. We ask in the questionnaire whether the party won or lost. Uh, we were told when we were developing the questionnaire, don't ask actually if they won or lost because no self-respecting attorney is going to check a box saying we lost. So we actually use a gentler euphemism. We say was the award more favorable, less favorable, or about as expected. Now that's important because a lot of people were concerned when we started doing this that the only people who would fill out an AIQ were losing parties. I call it the disgruntled losing party problem. The concern is since you can't appeal an award and you can't sue an arbitrator because of qualified immunity, you could get your vengeance by filling out a nasty AIQ on them. Okay? Uh, but we have, I think, short-circuited that. And so far, the data we've collected suggests that we are doing pretty well. Uh, we're not, that's not what we're seeing, although I will confess in a moment I'll explain to you how we've gotten our data so far. Um, and you know, we've, we still recognize this is an issue. The number one protection in the Arbitrator Intelligence Questionnaire, or AIQ, against the disgruntled losing party is that, depending on how you answer the questions, approximately 80% of the questionnaire is purely factual. Okay, there's no discretion built in, there's no on 80% of the questions. For those that have evaluative aspects to them, we can cross-reference winners and losers. We can sort the data, use as a filter that question to see are the losers being unduly harsh. And we have a number of other types of filters we can use. For example, the size of the case in terms of uh, monetary value. The uh, seat, the arbitral institution, uh, so let's look at another aspect that I think arbitrator intelligence will improve dramatically. Now, it's a huge ongoing debate in the community. Do we want document production? Do we not want document production? And the reality is, sometimes you want it because you are the claimant and you need documents from the other side to meet your burden of proof. And sometimes your client is such that you don't want it, even, uh, even if it's the same attorney, because your client has all the dirty documents and you really don't want to have to turn those over. So document production tends to be a question we ask a lot about when we are searching for an arbitrator. And so maybe with your phone calls, you find two or three people who have encountered this arbitrator and they all tell you, oh, this person never grants document production. I've, you know, all three of my, you know, each one of those three says never a document production. But the problem is you don't know if those three cases are outliers or are typical of the 50 cases that that person has sat in in the last year. So one thing that can help is data. So you can go, the co uh, column on the uh, left is all the topics we have information on. We go to document production. And these charts, again, they're all hypothetical data, but we hypothesize that uh, most parties don't request any, and she is slightly less likely to grant document production than uh, other arbitrators. Here, we, we have a baseline comparison, so you can see, these are maybe a little too fast, uh, so you can see how, what Artemis's track record is compared to the average. So you know not just what she does in absolute terms, but what she does compared to other arbitrators. Now this, we also ask um, for, we, people want to know sort of what's her track record with regard to particular categories. So here what we did is we took um, the categories roughly tracking uh, the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. And as you can see here, uh, it's probably a little inconsistent with the last uh, hypothetical data, but she's, you know, issuing more broad categories than the others, but uh, mostly individually identified documents. 
Okay? And then the last uh, uh, topic that I'll show you, even if we have about more than a dozen, uh, is another important topic that people ask about when they're trying to pick an arbitrator. And that is, how long does this arbitrator take to issue an award? Now, there are uh, a lot of um, considerations or variables that can go into a delay or the time that it takes to issue an award, including your co-arbitrators. So when I have been presenting the AIQ, not the, the outcomes, uh, I think the number one question I get asked is by arbitrators, can arbitrators fill out the AIQ? I'd like to tell you about what happened in that case and why my co-arbitrator took so long. Okay, uh, no, actually, uh, arbitrators cannot fill out the AIQ, nor can personnel at arbitral institutions. Um, the idea is that they have special confidentiality obligations that don't allow them to. Uh, we have been asked it so many times. I have been thinking about ways we might develop uh, a separate questionnaire that would maintain that confidentiality, but for today, uh, arbitrators can't fill it out. On the other hand, again, if you happen to call three people and they said, oh, this arbitrator took so long, can't believe how long, you know, when that, when that arbitrator was on the tribunal, the award took. Again, you don't know if those are three outlier cases or if those are quite typical of the arbitrator. And so here, uh, we've imagined uh, she, that Diana is a very good arbitrator. So, and you can also sort the data, for example, by what her position was. And you can see when she was the sole arbitrator, she generally came in below the average. The sloping line is the average time for an arbitrator, for all the arbitrators in our database to issue an award. And we also, again, have these pop-ups that will help you to decipher things. So, for example, you might want to know how are we determining what the value is, okay? So this chart, we have sort of like the ICC. We've imagined that the, uh, the, 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 um, with the hypothetical data that the higher value, the case, the more complex, and so it would necessarily take longer to render the award. So that slope is the average of all the arbitrators we have in our database, and the individuals are based on her position. All of our data can be sorted by the position, and we think, okay, well, when she's the sole arbitrator, that might be the most representative uh, of her timing because she's in complete control. Um, when she's a chair, maybe, although sometimes it, there can be a rogue uh, co-arbitrator, we might say, okay, well, as a, as a, cha as a, a chair, maybe she has somewhat uh, more responsibility uh, or control. Uh, and as a, as a co-arbitrator, you can see those are the only times where she really goes outside the norm. Uh, and it's probably due to a, a bad co-arbitrator on the other side. So that is uh, a preview of our prototype. We will uh, be posting it on our website, and what we'll be doing in the coming weeks and months is working to refine it. Uh, the way we developed our AIQ is we came up with what we thought was a wonderful, fantastic, brilliant questionnaire, and then we started vetting it, introducing it in, in various places, and everyone explained to us how we were completely wrong. <laughs> so we worked, we worked, we improved it, we posted it for public comment. We had, I think, eight months total of public comment on that, and that's why I think today we have a very strong AIQ. We will be doing the same with our prototype before we generate any uh, reports on individual arbitrators, we want to make sure that the model we're working with uh, is optimal. And so we will be uh, doing in-house webinars for both uh, corporations and law firms. Um, we uh, will do also both on the web so we can have more global reach uh, and whenever possible. I love talking to people physically because you learn so much when you talk to them about how do you pick an arbitrator, what are your concerns, how do you think this data will be useful. What would you like to see in the report? Um, and then we are hoping, our goal right now, is to have actual reports, probably on just a few arbitrators to start with, ready by September. And we'll roll them out as, uh, as, you know, as based on the data that we have. Uh, one important, again, protection for arbitrators is that, also because of data protection rules, uh, we will not uh, make available for sale any uh, a, any AI report on an arbitrator unless they consent. Okay, that's first of all legally necessary, but it's also respectful uh, and a good idea. Um, the, uh, the other thing we will be rolling out soon is what we are calling a membership program. 
coming soon. Uh, we will be inviting uh, law firms all over the world to become a member. Uh, and in the membership involves agreeing to give us AIQ responses on your cases. And we agree to give you a massive discount on the price of AI reports. Why? Because we need the data to be able to generate the reports. And we want people, members, to fill them out in a responsible way. We think that's the best way to ensure that most of our data is filled out in a responsible and respectful way. Um, to date, we have uh, over 700 AIQs. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you now how we did that. Um, it's really hard to get people to fill out a questionnaire. I fly Delta. Every single flight, they send me this annoying email. Would you please just take a moment to fill out three questions? Our questionnaire is really long. It has a lot of questions. Okay? Uh, and so the way we got most of our data is through campaigns. Um, we put out an announcement to ask for ambassadors to sign up to help us. Our first campaign was in Latin America. We sent out a call for ambassadors, which is a code word for someone who's willing to work for us for free, okay? Because <laughs> we have a real shoestring budget. And in the course of a week, we had over 100 people apply. Um, we selected 30 of them, and you might think, okay, well, a bunch of students signed up. Well, we have, you know, among them, two law professors, several partners at law firms, the Deputy Attorney General of Ecuador, Okay. And then my amazing uh, research assistants, uh, and that's literally how this has developed, came up with this terrific idea of how to run a campaign. They give them checklists at each week, they meet with them, and these ambassadors go out and do just amazing work. And they generated, in a six-week campaign in Latin America, over 250 AIQs. And it worked so well, now we're doing campaigns elsewhere. And in fact, right now, ending on Monday, we're doing a campaign on Central and Eastern Europe. And we have here today two of our ambassadors. So one of the other reasons why ambassadors sign up is because they believe in our mission statement to promote diversity, accountability, and, um, and uh, excuse me, <laughs> transparency. Uh, and so, they, so also in Central and Eastern Europe, we've had amazing ambassadors sign up. We have had over 70 AIQs collected in just two and a half weeks from Central and Eastern European uh, jurisdictions. These are our two uh, ambassadors who are here today. Where are they? Okay. And uh, they're also uh, staffing a table out there. They, they actually were selected because they were among some of our most uh, active and successful ambassadors in bringing in AIQs and other activities. If you look around, you will see our other ambassadors giving lectures at universities, uh, asking for opportunities to speak at conferences about arbitrator intelligence. And again, it's because they believe in the project. And one of the things they've been able to do is also uh, bring to a local level this project that otherwise might seem very far away. Now, why did we start in Latin America and Central and Eastern Europe? Because one of our core parts, one of our core goals in our mission statement is to increase diversity. And I personally believe that while there are a lot of causes for the lack of diversity, that one of the most important solutions is not just raising awareness, but, but giving people an occasion and an opportunity to appoint diverse parties. Why don't they? Let's do this hypothetical. You have a, uh, a Romanian arbitrator, let's say Diana Artemis, very early in her career, and she sat now in three cases, and she was absolutely brilliant. Both sides, the parties thought so, both sets of attorneys thought so, her co-arbitrators thought so, okay? But how many people on the planet know that? And what are the chances that they're gonna get a phone call? Okay, because nobody knows to call them because their identities are not secret. Now, GAR has a project that actually helps with that somewhat because they, in their project, GAR uh, tool, art tool, um, they provide names of people who you can call. And that's certainly useful. But it's of limited utility if you don't know them um, and you can't call them. And if they get flooded with phone calls, they're gonna stop answering, okay? So while we think GAR art is really important and useful in increasing transparency, it does have its limitations. 
We started with central, with the, we're starting with the outer lying jurisdictions because we want to get as much information about newer arbitrators in these outer lying jurisdictions before we focus on central, uh, excuse me, on the United States and Western Europe. So it's part of a strategic effort to start with diverse candidates and diverse arbitrators, information about diverse arbitrators. So that is all I have for you. Um, you should watch for the prototype being posted on our website, coming out soon. We welcome your feedback. Uh, we recognize that, there are, that people have different opinions. Um, and again, we welcome the, the good, the bad, and the ugly in them. Um, and we hope that you uh, live to, uh, d uh, to, to die another day. Excuse me. I was supposed to have my slide come up with my last poster, and I missed it. But thank you again to the organizers. Again, this was such a wonderful opportunity for to have an audience as uh, bright and, um, uh, and engaged as it comes to Vienna Arbitration Days to be able to present our, our prototype.